Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My Karen wife won't let me buy the coffee I want, even though I'm the only one who works. After that, am I the jerk for firing an employee returning from maternity leave? I really don't think I'm in the wrong here. And after that, boss man says I have to scan packages before I load them, then gets mad when I refuse to load unscanned packages. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to control what coffee anyone else drinks. Salted caramel frappuccino for the win, bruh. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen wife won't let me buy the coffee I want even though I'm the only one who works. I've lately come to enjoy some nicer coffee than I usually drink. I brew it at home, so we're not talking daily $7 drinks or anything. Instead of getting a giant bulk bag of Kirkland coffee, I've come to enjoy a $12 bag from the grocery store. It lasts a bit over a week, maybe two, instead of $15 for about five weeks. My wife doesn't work. I work from home. She also unfortunately isn't doing a lot around the house right now because of a medical condition. I've been picking up most of the slack while she sits around. This has been going on for six months for the household, years for the job. Yes, she has depression, Yes, she's getting treatment for it. I try my best to do what I can, but oftentimes I have to ask her multiple times to help with even simple tasks to share responsibility. We've had discussions on how I know she's working on the issue, but I can't do everything on my own. I make plenty to be able to have my coffee be a splurge. She'd previously commented on the cost, and I said, it's well within the budget, and I like it. It's fine. Edit. I'd shown her the grocery budget, which is nearly always under budget every month for the past few years. I brought home another bag the other day, and she made another comment along the lines of, You're spending way too much on this fancy coffee. You need to go back to the other stuff. Having had to make the grocery run again, after doing other household chores that morning, I snapped. The one with the job gets to make the grocery choices. Work again, or contribute to the household, and you can have a say in what we buy. She called me a cold-hearted jerk and stormed out of the room. So, am I the jerk for my reaction to being called out on coffee buying? Everyone sucks here. For your part of it, it's only for saying the one with the job gets to make the grocery choices. In my opinion, that is cold-hearted. But if it really is the difference of $4.50 a week and that's within the budget, then she's being unreasonable. Not the jerk for buying the coffee you want, but a statement like that makes you sound like an obnoxious jerk. You get the jerk rating for that. If the situation were reversed, would you want your wife to be so dismissive of your concerns? You and your wife are life partners, for better or for worse, so what's yours is also hers and vice versa. Explain to her that you enjoy this coffee and it's under budget and continue to buy it if you want to, but don't act like some egotistical jerk. Everyone sucks here. As long as you're not about to lose the house or in financial troubles, she should not be dictating what you can and can't buy. It doesn't sound like this coffee is going to break the bank. She's a jerk for that. Maybe worth talking to her about why she has such anxiety about finances. It could come from her background or possibly from feeling guilty about not being able to work. On the other hand, you are absolutely the jerk for saying because you earn the money, you make all the financial decisions. You agreed to support her and she has valid reasons for not being able to work. If you don't like this situation, divorce her. But saying you get to make all the financial decisions because you're making the money is heading down the path of financially mistreating her. Comments like this are only going to make her more worried about your finances. You're the jerk. You sound like a monster to be honest. Why do men still think it's our job to be your maids? Newsflash, it's not the 50s anymore. As a married couple, whatever money you earn is just as much hers as it is yours. When I was growing up, my dad tried the same crap telling my mom that because he was the one working while she was watching TV all day, that he got to make the big financial decisions. Long story short, she decided to leave him and he's still paying her alimony to this day. Instead of retiring early like he planned to, he's still working at almost 70 years old and she gets to enjoy her life like she deserved to. That's what I call a win and I hope your wife does the same thing to you for how horribly you're treating her. And they wonder why the marriage rates are declining so much. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or his wife? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for firing an employee returning from maternity leave? I really don't think I'm in the wrong here. I feel like the devil right now, so I'll accept whatever judgment you all have. I run a team of about six people. 
Our company offers a large amount of maternity leave, 10 months. One of my employees got pregnant recently, I'll call her Jess. Our team does project-based work, and in the period between her leaving for maternity leave, we finished up the project we were working on when she left and started working on a project without her. During this period, our team had to adapt to working without her expertise in certain matters. We adapted and eventually some of us developed the skills needed to do some of her workload. The situation we have now is me and two others split half the work that Jess used to do and we have hired someone new to come into the team to handle the other part of Jess's workload and then some. This new employee came at significantly reduced cost as he was straight out of uni and we pay him a fraction of what Jess costs currently. Now Jess has come back to the team, but there's another issue. Our firm has informed us that for some stupid reason, we no longer have the budget for a seven person team and we'll have to let someone go. The news came about when I submitted the paperwork for Jess's return. We are five months into a project that should take an estimated 10 months and my decision came down to Jess and the man we hired to replace her. The reason we hired a replacement, which is not normally what we do, is because we anticipated that for this project, the workload would be far greater than our current capacity, which it is not. As you can tell by the title, I chose the replacement. I did so for the following reasons. Far cheaper, thus freeing up a lot more money than keeping Jess on. He was up to date on the project, and we would be able to move forward seamlessly, whereas with Jess, we would have to take time catching her up to speed on half the project. The clients already knew and liked working with him, whereas they didn't know Jess at all. She's been out of the field for a prolonged period, whilst he's been here for the past nine months, so she may or may not find it hard to adapt back to work life, whilst with him it isn't a question. He performed his work better than she did hers and interacted better with the team. Obviously, the ideal situation which I wanted was to keep both and not put a new single mother with no other job lined up out in the cold, but I had to do right by the team and firm. I told her I'd write her a brilliant letter of recommendation and that in a few months she could try and apply for a job at our firm. Hopefully we'll have the budget, but she snapped at me and told me not to bother and called me a jerk and left. I know I sound cold and heartless, but I had to be fair to both employees, not just Jess, right? You're the jerk. Every single reason you mentioned was only true because she had been gone for maternity leave, which legally cannot be a reason to terminate someone. Yet it is the cause behind every reason you gave. Be prepared for a lawsuit. OP somehow firmly believes he's free and clear of all legal ramifications. And while I haven't seen what country they're in, I have a hard time believing after all his comments, he can prove he fired her above board. ETA, not to mention, he says more than once in the comments how no one was even remotely qualified to fill Jess's shoes and perform her role to the same extent she did. Heck, even in the original post, he says it took three people to take on her job. How can you justify firing her for anything but punishment for using a benefit her own company provided? Bonkers. I mean, his first attempt posting here said he basically fired his employee for being pregnant. If that's not admission of discrimination, I don't know what is. In the words of Andrew Garfield in The Social Network, you better lawyer up, jerk. You're the jerk. Jess, if you ever see this and the OP is deleted, I took screenshots. You're punishing her for having a baby and taking the maternity leave that your business offers? You knew she was coming back. Why didn't you hire a temp replacement until that time? You're not going to save money after she takes legal action for being fired because she's a mother. You're the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for firing them or not? Please let us know. If you knew she was returning, why hire a permanent replacement for her? I don't get that. Boss says I have to scan packages before I load them, then gets mad when I refuse to load unscanned packages. First things first, backstory. I work at a large hub facility of a well-known shipping company as a package handler. Essentially, it's our job to handle the packages, as the name implies, pulling them off trucks, sorting them out, and putting them on new trucks depending on where we're put in the facility. I work with the main delivery trucks that deliver packages to homes and smaller businesses. The packages come with barcodes on the side as well as small spot labels to allow someone to see the address, which part of the facility they go to, and which truck they are to be put on. We used to be given small scanners that would scan the barcodes in order to ensure we didn't put the packages on the wrong trucks or get a package that didn't belong in our area, as sometimes the labels could be wrong due to errors or a package might lose its label. 
The trucks are even fitted with sensors, so if you scan a package and try to walk into a truck where it doesn't belong, the scanner would start to whine. With that set up, now enters our main antagonist of the story, Alan, my former supervisor. Alan is a short skinny guy with a thin mustache and is a micromanager of the highest degree. He always walked up and down the trucks to watch us work, watched us from a distance or close by with his arms crossed to get us to work faster, constantly told us to grab all of our packages as they come to us despite the fact they go around on a moving conveyor belt that literally loops them back if we miss them, told us to load up our larger packages as soon as we get them despite the fact it makes it harder to move through the trucks and place other packages on the shelves and even hopped into some people's trucks to move packages around the right way, his way. I can go on and on about Alan, but today I'm here to vent about just one of these events or we would be here all day. So anyways, Alan had me and the other package handlers of our area in a group texting chat in order to tell us our start times for the next shift, as well as compare our work speeds to each other via our scanning count. I assumed to make us feel bad and work harder, but we don't really care. Around that time, the number of packages we misloaded onto our trucks, as we call it, had increased. And ever since, Alan had been adding to his group messages that we need to scan every package and make sure that we are aiming for zero misloads. Annoying, but nothing too serious, at least I thought. On to the actual story portion. So, one day I'm working on belt, as usual, and my scanner starts deciding to mess up, as they tend to do if smacked or if the battery comes loose. I go to Alan and ask him if he could help me fix it or give me a new one to use. Instead, he takes it and tells me to keep loading my trucks without the scanner and just use the labels on the packages. This isn't really allowed, and instead, I chose to stack the packages in front of the trucks so I can scan them once I get a new scanner. Alan eventually comes down and tells me to just load them into the trucks normally and to stop stacking. Frustrating, but I shrug and do it and I try to avoid any real conflict. That evening, Alan messages the group and lists out our speeds, with me at the bottom and is once again spouting on that we need to make sure we are scanning our packages before loading them, and even comes to talk to me the next day about my number of misloads. I'm angry, of course, as he is the one to tell me, but at that point, I was still fairly new to the job and didn't feel comfortable arguing with the supervisor, so I just try to continue on with my work with a mental note of always scanning my packages no matter what so he can't pull this again, unaware that this will be my malicious compliance later on. Fast forward a few months later, Alan is leaving for real estate and is training one of the package handlers to be his replacement before he leaves. By that time, I'm fed up with all the micromanaging and pestering and I can't wait for him to be gone. It's about the final week of his employment that I'm working the belt and once again, my scanner messes up and stops working. I hand it over to Alan once again and just like before, as if he has never cared about scanning, he tells me to keep loading the trucks. I smile to myself and nod. So I continue, stacking my packages in front of my trucks, waiting for that new scanner to arrive. Not long after, Alan comes back with the trainees at his side. He asks me what I'm doing and I tell him I'm stacking my packages. Once more, he tells me to keep loading my trucks and this time I talk back, telling him I'm not loading them without a scanner. I have to admit, at this time, I was done with Alan and let my anger get the better of me, raising my voice and getting a bit shaky as I have a very hard time dealing with anger, especially after dealing with his crap for so long. The trainee tries to settle the situation and tells me to just keep stacking and they'll get me a scanner right away, but is interrupted by Alan telling me once again to load my trucks, this time louder. I flatly respond, no, and thus it goes back and forth like this for nearly half a minute before I eventually tell him to get it to me in writing because I'm not getting fired over this. Remember, we're not supposed to load a package without scanning it and can indeed get in trouble if they can prove we did this intentionally. This seems to get him even more mad and he eventually tries to pull the head supervisor card. He asks me if I would like him to get the head supervisor to try and intimidate me. I wasn't able to chuckle in my anger and just told him to go ahead and get him. Him and the trainee walk off with him storming down the belt. A few minutes later, the trainee comes back with a scanner in hand apologizing and telling me to just get back to work. I didn't see Alan for the rest of the day, and if memory serves, the rest of his final week as well. Sorry if it's not as explosive as some of the other posts, but this was just my first real malicious compliance, 
and I hope you enjoyed the read all the same. And to any supervisors reading this, please just let us do our jobs. Have you ever had a micromanaging boss that yells at you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I unloaded trucks at Walmart once for about a week. I couldn't take the constant yelling from the manager. I just gotten out of the military. The last thing I wanted to do was be yelled at in the civilian world. My fiance hid my engagement ring as a prank. My fiance, male 31, proposed to me, female 28, days ago. He has this habit of joking around and pulling pranks from time to time. It bothers me sometimes, but I try to have patience. His family wanted to throw us an engagement party at a restaurant. I heard his mom talk about how expensive the place was and how much money they paid for reservations, so this was clearly a huge deal for them. My fiancé and I were getting ready. I noticed my engagement ring wasn't where I left it before I entered the shower. I freaked out and looked for it everywhere. I asked my fiancé about it and he said he didn't see it. I freaked out and was running out of time for the party. He sat there watching me, almost losing my mind and trying to find it, to the point where I started crying because without the ring, I couldn't show up to the party. I kept thinking about what his family would say and how they'd think I was irresponsible to lose the ring that is somewhat expensive. I gave up looking and sat down and just cried in frustration. Next thing I know, my fiancé was standing in front of me, laughing with his hand extended to me with the ring in it. I asked where he found it and he could barely speak and say that he hid it last minute before the party as a prank. I was in shock. He casually told me to get ready so we could get there on time, but I just sort of blew up on him and started yelling, saying he hid the ring, made me freak out for two hours almost, and almost made me miss the party. He was like, relax, it was a prank, okay? Don't make a big deal out of it and ruin the evening. I told him I wasn't going to the party, and that if his family asked, I would tell them it was because he hid my ring. He freaked out and started begging me to let it go and just go with him, but I refused and went into the bedroom, took my medication and stayed there. He lost it and kept saying that I blew this out of proportion and that I ruined my own party and cost his family money and disrespected them by not attending. His family found out and they were mad at him, but also me for choosing to not attend and getting over it. But I was in a horrible state emotionally and couldn't handle being in a public place after what had happened. Am I the jerk for choosing to not go after he hid the ring? Info. Why would you marry someone who thinks making you cry is funny? OP. He said that I'm prone to crying and that I get emotional and cry over every little thing, which isn't his fault, basically calling me a drama queen. I do tend to overreact sometimes, but I genuinely was worried about losing the ring. Every single sentence of this comment sent shivers down my spine. Get out while you do not have legally binding ties to this man. 1. It doesn't matter if you're the biggest drama queen in the world. There is no excuse for being deliberately cruel. Making someone cry on purpose and then belittling them for crying is deliberately cruel. I really hope you do not marry someone who treats you this way. 2. Unless his family paid for the ring, it's absolutely none of their business whether you lost it. They sound like very unpleasant people, honestly, and if your fiancé isn't sticking up for you when they're out of line, well, see point number one. Not the jerk. A prank that results in a loved one's emotional and physical panic for hours is not funny, not okay. You did not make a big deal out of it. It is a big deal that he likes to be cruel and finds it amusing to see you suffer. He ruined a special evening because he wanted you to be stressed out and suffering instead of wanting you to feel loved and happy as you deserve to on such an occasion. And he disrespected and tainted the ring that is supposed to represent your unity and love for one another. This is fully on him. He made a mistake in believing that he could manipulate you into relaxing about his cruelty. But you respect yourself too much to play along. I'm proud of you OP for valuing yourself when he clearly does not value you. I would never put that ring on ever again. He ruined everything, but at the end of the day, you dodged a bullet. He doesn't deserve you. You're the jerk. You're still engaged to a person who thinks it's funny to watch you panic, suffer, and cry. Your partner likes to make you suffer. It amuses him to see you like this. Does this sound like a partner you can trust to have your back and support you? Because he keeps not having your back and supporting you in small things, so why should you trust him with big things? You're a jerk for accepting the ring, saying yes, and remaining engaged to him. Stop being a jerk. Everyone sucks here except your in-laws. Your fiancé sucks because a prank is about 5 minutes, not 2 hours. You because your in-laws spent a lot of money. 
If you were going to punish them for their son's actions, you should have the courtesy to call them, or pulled it together and just gone mad or not gone. Exactly. The only acceptable reason not to go to an expensive engagement dinner would be if you called off the engagement. Anything else is petty and you need to get over it and keep it between the two of you. However, if your man is really as callous as you described, you need to dump him. I can't imagine my husband letting me stress, cry, and get upset for two hours as a joke, especially not before something for his family that you need to make a good impression on, like hair and makeup, etc. I don't think either of you are ready for marriage. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her fiancé? Please let us know. If you don't like pranks, never start dating a prankster. It won't work out. Am I the jerk for not supporting my husband's kids? I'm 28, female. My husband is 35, male, and we've been married for a year. We dated for two years prior to that. When we met, I said I didn't want to have kids of my own, but wouldn't mind being in a relationship with someone who has kids. We came to the agreement that he would be solely responsible for his kids, minus the little stuff. I love my husband a lot, and his kids are alright. The older two are great, but the younger two are a bit much. We've had separate finances our whole relationship, since he has kids and I don't. When I moved into his house, we agreed that I would pay one-fourth of the mortgage since it's a four-bedroom and three out of the four rooms go to his kids. I pay one-fifth of the utilities since there's five of us living here, myself and then him and his four kids. I also buy my own groceries separate from them since I'm really into fitness and I meal prep once a week. It's just the best way to go about it. This was the agreement we came to two years ago and we've stuck to it. Recently, I've gotten a new car and I guess he's realized my finances vary a bit more from his than they used to. I work as a travel nurse, going to wherever pays the most for about one third of the year. I make pretty good money and I've saved a lot. I make around $130,000 a year. Meal prepping and responsible spending has helped a lot. I don't buy myself a lot of luxuries other than my new car. My husband works as a mechanic and he makes a fair amount considering we live in a low cost of living area, around $40,000 a year. Well, he wants me to start setting up college funds for his kids, and he wants to have a joint account and pay our bills based off our income. Essentially, he wants me to pay two-thirds of everything related to the household and him pay one-third. I don't think it's fair at all. He decided to have four kids, and I decided not to have any because I would rather spend my time and money on myself. He thinks it's not fair that I can buy myself an expensive car while he still drives an older car that needs work. Ultimately, I asked why he agreed to the split we have now if he wasn't okay with it and he just changes the subject. Am I the jerk for not wanting to support his kids? So, he's below the poverty line and you're at the upper class income threshold. You're married and completely comfortable seeing your stepkids struggle because your income blocks them from student aid and FAFSA that they'd more than qualify for if you weren't in the picture. Financially, he'd be better off if he divorced you and rented your room out to some random person. That's not a marriage. You're friends with benefits at best. Everyone sucks here. I don't understand why you want a relationship where you have discretionary spending and he can't afford reliable transportation to work. I don't understand why he signed up for that. I don't understand how you intend to live your life completely separate from the four kids you live with. Anyone else read this and think, oh, those poor kids. They've got a mom that doesn't want them, a stepmom who barely tolerates them, and a dad struggling to keep up on a $40,000 salary, which is only $8,000 above poverty level, and not a fair amount of money for five people, regardless of cost of living. Every adult sucks here. Mom for not caring about her kids and wanting them to take out loans to get through college. Dad for feeling he's entitled to college funds from OP's money and marrying a person not excited about his kids and OP for naively thinking that this detached arrangement would work long term without building resentment from her partner and his kids. Edit. OP clearly wanted a child-free life, but also a relationship with this man who has kids, so she thought she could detach herself enough financially and emotionally from them and this arrangement would be sustainable. Clearly it isn't and was never going to be. I'm really struggling to see how the OP barely tolerates her stepkids based upon the information provided here. Step parenting is hard, and part of the reason it is, is because of judgments and assumptions such as yours. As a step parent, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Can't overstep because you're not the actual parent. Can't take a step back because then you're detached. If she wasn't there, dad would have to cover expenses himself anyways. 
While I do think she should split living costs more equitably given the difference in income, she's not a jerk for not taking on full maternal responsibility of four kids she didn't choose to bring into the world and who might not even desire her to be a maternal figure in their lives. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. If you love the child-free life and you know that it's meant for you, never marry someone who has kids, you will totally regret it. Am I the jerk for telling my son that if he can't help me, then he can pay for his own stuff? I'm a mother of five and a half. I'm 46, female. I'm five months pregnant. I have two twin girls who I'll call Lisa and Sophia, who are 10. My youngest son, Joshua, who's 17. My baby, Emily, who is one. And my oldest son, Danny, who's 21, male. We were on a trip to Hawaii a few weeks ago. My husband didn't come because of an unexpected work emergency, but he told us to have fun. My twins cried a lot, so my son Joshua and I comforted them, but Danny stood there doing nothing. We had so many fun things planned to do with their father, but since he couldn't come, we didn't end up doing much. But whatever we did, except eat, Danny was absent for it. Like, for example, going to the beach, banana boats, luau's, and watching over his sisters when they just wanted to go to the pool. He'd stay in his room on his phone, chatting with his friends. The next week of vacation, I was stressed with Danny. I hated having to put most of the work on Josh because he wanted to have fun too, and my daughters helped with the baby. I called him down to help, but he said he wanted to relax and chill when we literally came here to relax, chill, and have fun though we weren't having lots of fun with less help, a crying baby, two 10-year-olds who wanted to go to the pool but had to do what I had capability of doing while caring, and my other son who wanted to get away from his sisters for at least an hour. It was a mess. I shouted at him, if you can't step up and help the woman who gave birth to you, lets you live in her house rent-free while giving you a job whose money you just spend on silly games instead of getting an apartment, then you can get out of my house and pay for your own stuff. He looked shocked and left, and just about an hour after, my sister-in-law and my in-laws called, asking me why I'd shout at my son when he did nothing. I told them, yeah, he's been doing nothing, except eating and chatting in his room with his silly friends, instead of helping his mother and siblings, and I hung up. When we got back from our vacation, my husband yelled at our son for not helping and sent him up to his room. Lots of our family are on my side, but my in-laws think I was in the wrong, so am I the jerk? Edit. I should have added more detail to avoid confusion. Danny does minimal work. I am not that type of parent. He co-parents. Edit. Babysits. I realized this was making people even more confused. All day, about once or twice a month, when his dad and I want to have some alone time. Josh also steps up as frequently as Danny too. Danny does also have a job I gave him, but he is an introvert. Stays in his room all day, every day, when he doesn't have work, which is only twice or three times a week only gets out to eat or go out to parties to hang out with his friends. Other than that, I expect nothing less from him than him keeping up good work in his job and helping out every once in a while with his sisters, just as Josh does. But his dad and I do on a daily, mostly weekends because of school. You're the jerk. What a nightmare. He's not your husband or the father of your kids. Stop popping them out if you can't handle so many. And I say this as a parent. You're the jerk. These are your kids. Stop parentifying your other kids to do childcare for you. If you can't handle your own kids, you shouldn't have had so many. If you couldn't handle them alone on vacation, you shouldn't have taken the vacation. It's not your oldest kid's job to be your slave. If you want them to pay rent or something, that's reasonable. But they didn't keep popping out more and more kids. You did. Those babies are no one's responsibility, but yours and your husband's. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Danny? Please let us know. I hope Danny's able to move out soon. Yowza kanowza. Karen mother-in-law said my chili wasn't spicy enough, so I made it spicy for her. In my last relationship, I lived with my husband, Danny, in a duplex owned by his mother, Donna. We lived on one side, and his mother and brother lived on the other side. Donna was a very horrible person and took great joy in belittling me and tormenting me every chance she got. She took extra pride in herself if she succeeded in making me cry. My ex-husband is a professional cook and would often prepare enough food for his mother in addition to ourselves. On occasions, when I would do the cooking, she also expected to be served dinner. One thing I made often was chili. Both my ex and his mother loved my chili, but both liked their chili on the spicy side. 
I never made my chili spicy, as I have a sensitive stomach. My ex would just add hot sauce to his serving and that was that. But Donna would complain endlessly about the chili not being spicy. Even going so far as to demand I make the next batch of chili spicy for her. I told her I wasn't going to do that because I wouldn't be able to eat it. She essentially told me that what I wanted didn't matter since she had been gracious enough to allow me to live in her home. I told her if she wanted it spicy, she could add hot sauce to it like my ex did or she could just make her own darn chili. So next time my ex told her I was making chili, she came over while I was making it and watched me like a hawk, demanding I add this, that, and another thing. I told her I would be making my chili the way I wanted to and she could go home and wait for it to be done or find something else to eat. She left and I continued tending to my chili. Now, my ex is somewhat of a hot sauce connoisseur and he's never met a hot sauce that was too spicy for him. So the previous Christmas, I bought him a bottle of Carolina Reaper Puree. When the chili was ready, he asked me to make a Tupperware container of chili for his mother while he used the bathroom and he'd take it to her when he was done. So, like the good little wifey I was, I put the chili into the container with a heaping tablespoon of Carolina Reaper, mixed it up really well, added some shredded cheese on top and closed it up, ready to be delivered next door. X finished in the bathroom, delivered the chili and we sat down to our meal. We had just finished, approximately 30 minutes later, when his phone rang. My ex liked to have his conversations on speaker, and I was glad of it this time. Danny, something is wrong. What's wrong, mom? This chili. Oh, it's burning me up. What did your wife do to this chili? X looks at me confused. I just shrug. She didn't do anything to it. It's just our normal chili. What did you add to it, mom? I added a little sriracha, but that shouldn't be hot like this. Well, maybe you added too much. That hateful jerk did something to my chili, Danny. I'm going to get her. Calm down, Ma. You're overreacting. I want her out of my house. You can't kick her out over chili, Ma. Watch me. She hung up. My ex looked at me and asked, Did you really do something to her chili? I smiled sweetly and said, She wanted it spicy. It's spicy. There were no real repercussions from this other than her losing it on me. Also, she was perfectly fine and never asked for my chili again. So, bonus. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.